so as Jack uh, mentioned, I'm a uh, law professor at the University of Chicago where uh, I write about election law and constitutional law. And uh, funnily enough, uh, I'm only uh, here today because a different University of Chicago law professor uh, also specializing in election law and constitutional law was unable to make it. Uh, that professor, or more accurately, that former uh, professor was Barack Obama, uh, who I understand has uh, more demands on his time uh, these days than I do. Uh, so for the, you know, like windsurfing in, in Fiji, for example, which I understand is uh, what he's mostly up to right now. Uh, so as Jack mentioned, for the last few years, I've been involved uh, with the issue of partisan gerrymandering, both as an academic and also as a litigator. Uh, as an academic, I've developed a uh, quantitative measure of gerrymandering that I'll talk about uh, a little later in my remarks. And uh, as a litigator, I've helped to bring two partisan gerrymandering cases over the last uh, couple years. Uh, one against Wisconsin's uh, state house plan, and the other against North Carolina's congressional map. And these are the only two federal cases to result in lower court decisions striking down maps as unconstitutional partisan gerrymanders uh, in the last 30 years. Uh, and as you may know, and as Jack also mentioned, the, uh, the Wisconsin case, Whitford, was argued in front of the Supreme Court in October, and we're all uh, currently waiting to find out what the court does on this uh, issue. Uh, so I could summarize the Whitford litigation, but because this is the American Philosophical Society, um, I didn't want to do something uh, that practical or that uh, concrete. <laughs> Uh, so what I'd like to do instead, and it's a bit more, uh, more abstract, is to uh, talk about the injury of partisan gerrymandering. So you know, what is the key harm that gerrymandering inflicts? Uh, why is it bad for democracy? Uh, why do we care about uh, this uh, so-called practice of gerrymandering? Um, so I'll start by going through some concepts that we often hear about that I don't think are the real problem with uh, gerrymandering. And then I'll identify what, in my view, is the essential injury with the practice. And just to give away my conclusion, it's the, uh, the misalignment, the uh, lack of congruence that gerrymandering causes uh, between voters and their representatives. Uh, that's what I think the real crux of the issue is. But before I get there, uh, let me start with uh, weird district shapes, which are often linked uh, to gerrymandering, especially in the popular discourse. Uh, lawyers would call this uh, district non-compactness or uh, irregularity. Uh, so journalists love to show uh, images of non-compact or weird-looking districts. Uh, and so in a few minutes of Googling last night, I was able to find uh, a number of examples of uh, notorious, strangely shaped districts. Uh, this is what used to be Pennsylvania's seventh district, not far from where we're sitting right now. Uh, this is the so-called pinwheel of death district in, uh, in Maryland. Uh, this is a, uh, another former district from North Carolina that was recently uh, invalidated. And uh, my personal favorite, this is the... Uh, <laughs> this is Illinois' uh, earmuffs district. And uh, uh, it is true that my wife, Ruth, and I put this district on our wedding cake uh, a few <laughs> years back. <laughs> Okay, so why isn't district non-compactness uh, the, the core of gerrymandering? Uh, there are two main answers. Uh, one is that there are lots of innocent explanations, um, or at least explanations other than partisanship for strange district shapes. Uh, districts can look funny because they're uh, following a coastline or a mountain range or a city boundary that itself is quite irregular. Uh, districts can also look funny uh, 
because they're trying to do things like protect an incumbent or include enough minority voters in order to enable a minority preferred candidate uh, to be elected. Um, that's what's going on in the Earmuffs District, incidentally. It's two Latino communities uh, that are joined together by this uh, long, thin connector uh, in order to enable the election of a, a Latino preferred candidate uh, in Chicago. Um, so the point is we simply can't infer from strange district shapes that any partisan manipulation is going on. Uh, we can guess that something is happening other than just a desire to follow uh, traditional principles, but we don't know what that something is. Uh, the second problem with compactness as the, the overarching value is that it simply isn't connected to anything else that we care about. So political scientists have calculated the compactness of every congressional district in the country, and they then looked at how various democratic values vary from the least compact to the most compact districts. Uh, so they've looked at things like voters' approval of their member of Congress, uh, voters' contact with their member, uh, voters' ability to name their member, uh, the member's responsiveness to his or her constituents. And basically none of these things vary in any significant way between the least compact and the most compact districts. So in other words, compactness doesn't result in any benefits that we can see in representation uh, because representation simply isn't a function of district shape. Okay, something else that might be the problem with gerrymandering is a lack of competition. So maybe the, uh, the, the crux of the problem here is that gerrymandering is causing districts to be uh, less competitive, to be won more often by incumbents, uh, to be won by bigger margins overall, uh, whoever is winning the district. Uh, well, as you can see here, it is true that competitiveness is declining in American elections. Uh, so there are now quite a few uh, fewer swing congressional districts than there were 10 or 20 years ago. There are quite a few more uh, safe congressional districts than, uh, than one or two decades ago. Uh, but it's really hard to blame gerrymandering for these developments because, as you can see here, uh, the trends are basically continuous over time. Uh, their, uh, you know, competitiveness is not falling in the years after redistricting and then staying constant in all other years, which is the pattern you'd expect to see if gerrymandering was the culprit uh, behind this trend. Um, instead, you see a monotonic decline in competitiveness over time. Uh, additionally, the, the reason we presumably care about competition in our elections is that we think we get better representation in more competitive districts. Uh, we think we get legislators who are uh, more moderate, uh, more willing to reach across the aisle, uh, more attentive to their constituents. Uh, but as this somewhat complicated looking chart uh, shows you, that's not actually the case. So the, um, the X axis here is the margin of victory in a uh, state house race, uh, where the Republican candidate wins if the margin is uh, greater than zero, and the Democratic candidate wins if the margin is uh, uh, negative. Uh, the y-axis here captures what's known as the ideal point of each state house member. Uh, ideal point is just a fancy term for the ideology of a state house member uh, as captured by all of the votes that the member casts uh, in the legislature. And um, as you can see, within each party, there is essentially no relationship between district composition and legislator behavior or legislator ideology. Uh, so Republicans from competitive districts are almost exactly as conservative as Republicans from safe districts. And Democrats from competitive districts 
are almost exactly as liberal as Democrats from uh, safe districts. So the point is that greater district competitiveness simply doesn't yield any appreciable benefit in legislator moderation or, uh, or centrism. They're just unrelated uh, variables. Okay, so uh, let's turn to um, another uh, uh, concept we often hear about, uh, legislative polarization, uh, the, the distance, the, the gulf between the typical Democrat in the legislature and the typical Republican in the legislature. Uh, maybe that's the real harm of gerrymandering. Uh, so as you can see here, the polarization of the U.S. House um, has in fact been going up steadily over the last 40 years. Uh, Republicans in particular uh, have gotten much more conservative in the U.S. House uh, since roughly the late 1970s, uh, while Democrats of all varieties, Southern, Northern, and overall, uh, have been getting somewhat more liberal over this uh, period. Um, polarization, I think, is also quite a bad thing in our democracy because uh, it causes gridlock when you happen to have divided government, and it causes uh, very extreme policy outcomes when you happen to have uh, unified government in Washington. Uh, but once again, it's really hard to pin the blame on gerrymandering uh, for, for this rise in polarization. Uh, so like the trend I showed you a minute ago for competitiveness, the uh, polarization trend is basically continuous. It doesn't have any big jumps or leaps in redistricting years as compared to any other uh, uh, years. Uh, going back to the last slide, it's also hard to see how gerrymandering could be driving polarization because the only thing gerrymandering affects is the makeup of districts. And as we just discussed, the makeup of districts doesn't have a significant influence on legislator ideology or legislator behavior. Uh, and furthermore, if gerrymandering were the driver of polarization, then you'd expect to see a much bigger uh, rise in polarization in the U.S. House, uh, which has districts that can be gerrymandered, uh, as compared to the U.S. Senate, which has no districts to be redrawn. Um, but as you can see here, for more than a century, House and Senate polarization have been almost perfectly correlated. Uh, so House and Senate polarization were both very high in the Gilded Age, House and Senate polarization were both quite low from roughly the 1930s to the, uh, the 1970s, and House and Senate polarization have both surged together over the last uh, 40 years or so. Uh, so there clearly are powerful, significant historical forces that are driving these trends in polarization, uh, but gerrymandering can't be that force because if it were, we would see a differential impact on the House versus the Senate, and there's no trace of that uh, in the historical data. Um, okay, so if the, if the key injury of gerrymandering is not non-compactness, and it's not lack of competition, and it's not legislative polarization, then what is it? Uh, well, as I mentioned at the outset, what I think the core injury is, is the misalignment or the, the lack of congruence that gerrymandering causes between voters and their uh, representatives. Uh, to explain what I mean by this, I want to take a step back and uh, explain some of my uh, academic work on the measurement of, uh, of partisan gerrymandering. Uh, okay, so gerrymandering is always accomplished through uh, two techniques, um, cracking and packing. Uh, cracking refers to dispersing the opposing party's uh, voters across a large number of districts in which uh, those voters' preferred candidates consistently lose by relatively narrow margins. And then packing refers to concentrating, over-concentrating uh, 
the opposing party's voters in a small number of districts where their preferred candidates end up winning by overwhelming margins. Uh, and you can see in this little toy example here, uh, the Teal Party is able to crack the Navy Party's voters among three districts, and it also packs the Navy voters into two other districts, and the Teal Party uh, thereby wins uh, three out of the five districts in this very rectangular state, uh, even though the Teal Party is the minority party. Okay, so both cracking and packing produce what political scientists call uh, wasted votes uh, because they don't directly contribute to the election of a candidate. Uh, of course, these votes aren't literally wasted. People still show up at the polling place and cast their ballots. Uh, the votes are only wasted in the sense that they don't directly help to elect anybody. Uh, in the case of cracking, all of the votes that are cast for the losing candidate are wasted. And in the case of packing, all of the votes that are cast for the winning candidate uh, above the 50% plus one threshold that you need for victory, uh, those votes are wasted too. And the basic goal of gerrymandering is just to make sure that your side is wasting a lot fewer votes than the other side. Uh, another way of saying the same thing is you want the other side to be winning its districts by enormous, wasteful margins, while your side is winning its districts by uh, more efficient, more slender uh, margins, but still safe enough. So there's an arithmetical measure that I've, I've written about in my academic work called the uh, efficiency gap that captures this intuition. And uh, the efficiency gap is simply one party's total wasted votes over all of the districts in a map minus the other party's total wasted votes over all of the districts divided by the, the number of votes that are cast. And uh, the idea is that the efficiency gap uh, should be small when both parties are uh, roughly equally uh, having their supporters be cracked and packed. But if one party is disproportionately the victim of cracking and packing, then that party has many more wasted votes and there's a large efficiency gap that's, uh, that's produced. So in essence, the efficiency gap tells us in a single number uh, which party is benefiting uh, or being handicapped by all of the cracking and packing uh, in a map and how big or small that advantage or, uh, or disadvantage is. Okay, so we now have this quantitative measure of, uh, of gerrymandering. Um, is this measure actually linked to the alignment that we see between voters and their representatives? Uh, it is, and let me uh, unpack this chart to show, you, to show you why the answer is yes. Uh, so the x-axis in this chart is uh, the efficiency gap of a state house plan where positive numbers are uh, pro-Republican and negative numbers are pro-Democratic. Uh, the y-axis is, uh, again, the ideal point, the, the ideology of the median member of the state house, where uh, positive values reflect a conservative ideology and negative values reflect a liberal uh, ideology. And as you can see, as the efficiency gap becomes more pro-Republican, the median legislator becomes more conservative. And as the efficiency gap becomes more pro-democratic, the median legislator becomes more uh, liberal. Uh, and the crucial point here is that as the efficiency gap varies in this chart, voters' preferences do not vary. Voters' preferences are held constant. So imagine, for example, that we're dealing with a 50-50 state, a state that's half democratic, and half Republican. Uh, if that state happens to have a zero efficiency gap, then it gets a very moderate, centrist median legislator who looks just like the electorate. But if that same 50-50 state has a pro-Republican efficiency gap, then it gets a very conservative ideological median. And if that state has a pro-democratic efficiency gap, then it gets a very liberal 
ideological median, even though voters are still split 50-50 in that state. Um, so another way of making this point is that simply through the power of gerrymandering, it's possible to get anything from a very conservative legislature to a very liberal legislature, all for the same evenly divided electorate. Um, and that's really what I mean by misalignment, uh, a legislature that is uh, ideologically out of whack, uh, non-congruent with the voters of the state. Um, this chart shows you that gerrymandering is indeed a powerful driver of misalignment. Um, and then in my view, misalignment really is a massive problem for a democracy. You know, it's a direct attack on basic democratic values. Uh, the, the definition of democracy is a, uh, a kratos, a government of the demos, uh, the people. Um, it's really hard to say, I think, that the people are the ones who are governing when the legislature doesn't reflect their preferences, but instead is reflecting the, uh, the, the preferences of the gerrymandering party. Um, let me just close with uh, two more pieces of evidence that connect uh, gerrymandering to this uh, democratic harm of misalignment. Uh, this chart repeats the earlier analysis, but at the congressional level. So uh, now we see the uh, median ide ideology of a congressional delegation on the y-axis plotted against the uh, statewide democratic vote on the x-axis. And there are separate lines here for uh, Republican gerrymanders in red, Democratic gerrymanders in blue, and maps that aren't gerrymandered in green. And what you can see again is that there is this massive divide in how the very same, let's say, 50-50 state is represented uh, if it has a Republican gerrymander, a Democratic gerrymander, or no gerrymander at all. Uh, the state's median member of Congress is way too conservative for the state's electorate if there's a Republican gerrymander. The median member is way too liberal if there's a Democratic gerrymander. And it's only if there's no gerrymander that you actually get reflective, aligned, congruent representation uh, with the electorate. Okay, last thing, this is again a version of the slide you just saw a minute ago, only this time the y-axis is not just, it's not the, uh, the uh, median ideology uh, of the state legislature, instead it's the liberalism or the conservatism of the policy that is actually enacted in the state. You know, the laws that are really passed in the state. And what you see is the exact same relationship where uh, large Republican efficiency gaps produce policy that is too conservative for the voters in the state. And large Democratic efficiency gaps produce enacted laws that are too liberal for the people in the state. So in my view, this means that the harm of gerrymandering isn't limited just to representation, it isn't limited just to seats and votes. We see the injury materializing in the policies that are actually passed, in the laws that affect people's lives. Uh, these laws simply don't reflect the wishes of the public uh, when you have a large gerrymander. And in my view, that's the essence, that's the, the cardinal sin of, uh, of gerrymandering. Uh, thank you very much. Stay up there. Oh, that's right. Good questions also. Um, well, Nicholas, thanks a lot. I, um, I think I'm going to intervene slightly on my own to, to pose the first question, okay. if that's okay. I think it would be helpful if you explain jurisprudentially why the efficiency gap is such an important issue at this moment. Uh, sure. So jurisprudentially, we are in a bizarre legal limbo at present where the Supreme Court has told us unanimously that partisan gerrymandering can be unconstitutional if it's severe enough, but the justices have not been able to agree on a standard for distinguishing permissible from impermissible uh, gerrymandering. Uh, now, in the court's most recent gerrymandering case, five justices expressed some interest in quantitative measures of what political scientists call partisan asymmetry. Uh, 
However, Justice Kennedy in that case didn't like the metric that was presented to him there, but he expressed an openness to new technologies, new methodologies in this area. Uh, and so the efficiency gap is designed to address the concerns that Justice Kennedy raised about the earlier generation of partisan asymmetry metrics. Uh, and we'll, we'll see if he, if he bites in the Wisconsin case. But the idea is that the, the court gave us an opening for a test for gerrymandering based on a metric such as the efficiency gap. And uh, we're trying to exploit that window with the, the Wisconsin uh, gerrymandering case. Yeah. I love the idea that we're gonna see you know, <laughs> whether or not the court will bite <laughs> a particular, when a particular morsel is presented to the court. <laughs> uh, way in the back. <clears throat> Yeah, Rich Schifrin. Um, you may know there, uh, a paper that was on archive recently um, was suggesting an automated mechanism for producing compact uh, boundaries because they cite your work. Um, but uh, so there are methods that would be apolitical that would produce, let's say, reasonable compact uh, boundaries. How do you uh, get either the courts or the legislatures to agree to use such a thing? Uh, good luck convincing a, uh, a self-interested legislature to give up control over the uh, you know, most uh, significant of all of their activities to, uh, to a computer or to an algorithm. Uh, I, think that, you know, the, I, think, I think the odds of uh, voluntary transfer to, to a computer algorithm are, uh, are minimal. Uh, I guess I'll say a couple things. So even if voluntary transfer is sort of off the table, uh, there are a number of instances where uh, voter initiatives have been successful in states and have taken away the power to redistrict from legislators, uh, even if the legislators themselves didn't want to give up that power. Uh, and so I could easily imagine a voter initiative proposing this kind of transfer of responsibility, uh, even if it wouldn't happen uh, naturally on its own. Uh, second point is that putting aside the political process, in litigation, we have been uh, very actively relying on these sorts of technologies. Um, what we've used them to show is that the enacted plan in a given state is a extreme outlier compared to what you would have expected to see from a party blind redistricting process. Uh, and it's very powerful evidence to tell a court that look, here are 1,000, 10,000, separate district maps, all of which are better than the enacted plan on every nonpartisan criterion, but none of which are anywhere nearly as biased as the enacted plan. So courts have been uh, quite receptive to that sort of reasoning, uh, both in the Wisconsin and in the North Carolina cases that I've, that I've worked on. Hi, Lar Larry Tribe from Cambridge. Um, Nick, I'm wondering in a follow-up to Jack's question, whether the reaction of Justices Alito and the Chief Justice in the first of the Supreme Court's two arguments this year um, is a harbinger of a terribly negative kind or is simply leaves us guessing until June. That is, both of them said, we understand the efficiency <coughs> gap formula but we think the man on the street will not. We think that to most people it's going to sound like, I think the Chief Justice called it, gobbledygook. <laughs> and the question, I suppose, is, despite the encouragement that many of us got from the Pennsylvania Supreme Court's willingness to look at these things seriously and regard them as judicially manageable, do you suppose that the Supreme Court's estimation of the public's stupidity um, is so high that we really ought to be ready for very pessimistic news in late June. Uh, I mean, I, I think pessimistic news in late June is, is a, a very real possibility, although yeah, I'm, I'm, still, I'm still crossing my fingers. Um, I'll say a couple things on that. One is that, I mean, I, I think we shouldn't hold partisan gerrymandering to a unique standard uh, that we don't apply to any other area of law. Uh, 
So, you know, it's, it's true that the efficiency gap is more than counting, but it's not much more than counting. It's, you know, it's, it's some basic addition, subtraction, and division. Uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a much less complicated metric than other uh, methodologies that courts have to grapple with all the time in uh, Title VII employment discrimination cases, in fair housing cases, uh, in cases under the Voting Rights Act. So VRA cases, courts have to calculate uh, racial polarization in voting, which requires complicated regression methods. Uh, the efficiency gap is a, is a far cry from any of those things. And so I don't think that we need to, uh, it, it seems you know, unfair to say this is the one area of law where we insist on you know, third grade arithmetic, not sixth grade arithmetic. <laughs> Uh, let alone, you know, college or grad school uh, math. Um, the other point is that, you know, Roberts was worried about the response of the intelligent man on the street. Um, this was exactly the same worry that Justice Frankfurter had and Justice Harlan had uh, 50 years ago uh, during the one person, one, one vote revolution. You know, what will people think uh, if the court insists on perfect, numerically equal, arithmetically equal uh, uh, equality for district population. Um, and as it turned out, the, within a couple of years, the, the early one person, one vote cases became highly entrenched, uh, became considered one of the court's great success stories. Uh, and I don't see any reason why the same sequence wouldn't play out here. You know, one person, one vote is now understood, I think, as uh, a dramatic intervention in favor of basic democratic values by the court and a, and a successful intervention. Uh, and I kind of think, you know, once the, the storm clouds, once the immediate storm and drang recedes a little bit, uh, that's how a court intervention to, uh, to fight partisan gerrymandering would be received as well. The question of the balcony. Uh, Bob Tarjan, Princeton. Uh, your, the efficiency gap is promulgated on the two-party system as we know it today. Can you say anything about how third parties might or might not be affected by this or affect this issue? Uh, sure. So uh, my, my co-author has uh, developed a, uh, just a slight arithmetical extension of the original efficiency gap that is applicable to a multi-party context. Uh, the basic idea is that you uh, focus on two parties, but they can be any two parties to calculate the efficiency gap, and you then uh, aggregate all of the parties, uh, all of the votes and seats that other parties receive, and it's only a slight arithmetical extension of the original concept. Um, you know, the, the more cynical and but the more realistic answer is that as long as you have first-past-the-post, winner-take-all districts, third parties are not a significant feature of American legislative elections. Uh, you know, they win uh, uh, none or virtually none of the seats in Congress or any state legislature. And so it's a, it's a simplifying assumption, but it's a pretty accurate assumption that for all practical purposes, uh, third party influence and appeal is zero in, in American legislative elections. Yeah. Uh, Judge Tatel. Uh, David Tatel, Washington, D.C. Uh, Nick, for, uh, to give everyone here a complete view about what's going on in the court this year, I wonder if you might want to say something about the Maryland case, um, maybe about how it's different, uh, why you think the court took it, uh, and how it might influence how the Wisconsin case might be decided. Uh, sure. Yeah, so the, the Supreme Court currently has two partisan gerrymandering cases pending in front of it. Uh, one is the Wisconsin case. The other is a case involving uh, a single congressional district uh, drawn by Democrats in, uh, in Maryland. So the, uh, the principal distinctions in the Maryland case uh, are that uh, it involves only a single district, it's a congressional district, and it's a component of a, uh, a Democratic rather than a Republican gerrymander. Uh, and additionally, the Maryland plaintiffs are focused exclusively on the First Amendment, while in the Wisconsin case, we've relied on uh, both the, the First Amendment uh, and the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, the, the particular standard that's being advocated in the Maryland case is whether the, the line drawing party 
uh, intended to flip a district from one party's control to the other party's control, and then whether that party successfully accomplished that goal. So whether the targeted district uh, in fact flipped from uh, one party to the other party. Uh, why the court took the case, there's a happy story where the court wants to strike down one Republican gerrymander and one Democratic gerrymander. Uh, there's a less happy story for us uh, if the court was uh, reluctant to uh, attack maps in their entirety based on gobbledygook, uh, and instead if the court would prefer to target or to, to uh, attack gerrymandering through uh, a specific allegedly gerrymandered districts. Uh, I suppose if that's the court's intuition, then that would mean a victory in the Maryland case, but potentially a defeat uh, in the Wisconsin case. Um, I'll just mention my, my view of the Maryland theory is that it's a, a, a really flawed account of what gerrymandering is uh, for two reasons. One is that it focuses on a particular district, uh, whereas almost by definition, partisan gerrymandering is an aggregate collective activity. Uh, you know, the goal of the gerrymanderer is to win as many seats as possible statewide for the gerrymandering party. No one cares what happens in a single district. In fact, single districts can often be sacrificed for the sake of collective statewide advantage for a party. Uh, and the other flaw, I think, in the Maryland case is this use of the previous status quo as the baseline from which flipping is measured. Uh, it's unclear to me why we would care about flipping if we thought the previous baseline was an undemocratic, unfair, asymmetric baseline. Uh, you know, imagine in Wisconsin that uh, Democrats come to power in 2020 and they deliberately flip, you know, five or seven or 10 Republican districts to Democratic control. Uh, that might be unconstitutional under the Maryland theory, whereas I would see that as the uh, highly commendable uh, unskewing of what uh, was initially a very biased uh, district map. Um, so we made all of these points in an amicus brief to the court in the Maryland case, which uh, made the, the Maryland lawyers, whom I know well, uh, quite unhappy with, uh, with us. <laughs> Well, uh, Nicholas, thanks so much for this. Is actually, a useful contribution of knowledge in the spirit of the, the philosophical society itself. <laughs> sure, thank you.